introduction. So I'm going to talk to you about what's going on in Luxembourg on digital twins in mechanics and in medicine. So in case you uh, have not yet looked at where Luxembourg is situated on the map, it's in the center of Europe, close to Germany, Belgium, and France, um, as well as the Netherlands. And um, it's a small country that has a very vibrant research landscape. Uh, so if you Google Research Luxembourg, you will figure out that there is a lot going on behind the scenes of this country. Uh, now I'm going to describe to you what we do in uh, the University of Luxembourg in the field of data-driven computational sciences, for which we have created a doctoral program called um, Data and Computational Sciences, where 50 or 60 students work at the interface between different fields and the two key fields of computational science and data science that are merging together in order to provide tools for PhD students and researchers to apply in different areas. So for example, uh, psychology, but also social sciences, archaeology, biology, medicine, engineering, and uh, many others. So um, I'm going to show you a few examples from my team so that you can see what is going on. So on that slide, you see Arnaud Mazier, who is one of my uh, PhD students who graduated last week. And he's currently on that uh, film um, scanning a banker from the European Investment Bank, in other words, an economist. And uh, the idea is to acquire the geometry of this person in real time as fast as possible, and then to use that geometry in order to make certain decisions. So in that case, it was just a toy example, obviously, but just as you can see on the screen, you can replicate pretty quickly and with a certain accuracy, the shape and geometry of uh, virtually anything. And the application that we are interested in is the application in surgical simulation, surgical training and surgical planning. So what you see here is Arnaud uh, playing around with a haptic device on the left hand side and probing and prodding a liver on the right hand side, which belongs to a hypothetical patient. And the idea is that Arnaud is going to try to feel the stiffness of the patient, of the liver in that case, by prodding at different places along the liver, imitating what a surgeon would actually do in real life. And the difficulty here is uh, two-pronged. The first one is to acquire the proper geometry, as we saw in the previous slide, but the second, and it's actually the most difficult part, is to acquire the proper material model and the behavior of this organ, which is, as its geometry, totally patient-specific and extremely difficult to capture and also to parameterize for a given patient. So this is important because in certain applications, tumors, which are located in the breast, for example, move during the pre-operative to the intra-operative and post-operative phase. So on the left-hand side, you see a woman being scanned for breast cancer on the, in an MRI. You see the MRI on the top left part. This is called preoperative imaging, and you can then, as a surgeon, figure out where the tumor is located. So this is great. However, when the patient is operated on, uh, she is lying on the back and not facing down, which means that the tumor is going to be moving relative to the person and to the skin of the person, for example, and it's going to move around inside the breast, which means that when the surgeon operates in real life, the tumor has moved. Therefore, the preoperative image, which is at the top left, is no longer useful in itself in order to help the surgeon locate the target for removal or, um, or other type of therapies. Uh, that means that if we could deform the preoperative image into the intraoperative image by deforming the body of the, of the patient, we would then be able to predict where the tumor is in real life and therefore maybe even provide augmented reality to the surgeon so that they could see through the body of the patient to where the tumor is actually located. So that's the whole idea of the applications in medicine. Um, the difficulty in the previous case lies not only in the geometry again, but in the material model, which describes the behavior of the patient. Uh, breasts are all different in terms of stiffnesses, uh, size and, and shapes and so on, which means that having one generic example is not going to help a specific patient. So this is the difficulty and usually what we try to do is to have pre 
uh, let's say, preconceived knowledge about what's going on in reality, which means equations which are written down, they are set in stone. In that case, it is the governing equations, which are equilibrium equations that are given by Newtonian mechanics with a few adds on and bells and whistles in order to capture large deformations, but nothing very fancy. And then if we only kept those equations, we would not be able to replicate reality because reality is so specific to the patient that these equations would be incapable of replicating what goes on unless they are updated in real time by information that is being acquired as, it's, as it is acquired, similar to what's going on in weather forecast prediction, where you capture pressure, velocity, temperature at certain points in order to allow the simulation to converge faster to the actual weather that you experience in a given place. So this is what's going on in surgery. It's also going on in uh, preserving cultural heritage in conflict zones. This is the work of um, Juan Aguilar with Andrea Binsfeld and Patrick Suchte. And um, we are all working so from engineering to history of arts and archaeology to try to replicate what is going on in certain areas where it is difficult to get to, for example, Iraq in Mosul in that case. And in order to then allow people to visit virtually the place, to also reconstruct virtually artifacts and to even make uh, simulations of what would happen if someone was to build something on an archaeological site. So uh, the challenge here is that there is both too much data and insufficient data. And so this is the key uh, difficulty that we have to resolve in order to address the problems that we have in, uh, in archaeology. We have too much data because the points that we acquire using LIDAR are much too numerous, billions of points. And at the same time, we have no information about the materials that are being used there to construct things. We have almost no information and very little geotechnical information to be able to know what things were built upon because the data is very sparse or even absent. So I think that uh, would be it for, for an introduction. Um, I'd be, uh, I could go on on certain directions or maybe we could uh, start um, the discussion. Hi, Stefan. Um, are you just... Hello? Hi, are you pulling up another presentation or did you want to kickstart the Q&A? No, no, I, I, I think we can go on Q&A and I have some slides in case there are some more questions. I just don't want to, to speak for too long. I think we have enough time, um, if, if you're happy to. We usually start the Q&A at quarter two, so if you do have a few more slides that could inform um, the Q&A session as well. Okay, that's fine. So, um, and I will do that. Okay, so just give me one second. Okay. All right, thank you. Can you still hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, okay, great. All right, thank you. So that was the general introduction on what we uh, are doing generally in uh, data-driven modeling and simulation. And uh, now what I'd like to do is to run you through a series of examples where we are going to try and uh, reduce the computational expense associated with specific free boundary or interface problems. And I'm going to explain to you why these problems are important. So um, the problem that you see here is the problem of crack propagation that could take place in any structure. So for example, uh, aerospace structures or concrete structures that would be the most um, usual structures in which we would be interested in. And uh, the difficulty there is that uh, you need, as you can see on the top right slide, you need to be able to resolve what is going on at the, the vicinity of the crack as it initiates and propagates. Because as you can imagine, cracks 
initiate at a relatively small scale from micro cracks from atomic debonding. And then they merge together to form a macroscopic crack, which is a large crack, which then propagates and may destroy the structure. So the idea is to be able to take into account microstructural information and propagate it through the scales to the scale of the structure of interest. And this is also important in applications in surgery because often cracks, in that case cuts, are performed which creates topological changes because it splits an organ into, let's say, two sub pieces. And in the case of an airplane component, it will separate the component into several pieces, hopefully not uh, during the flight. And uh, this is something which needs to be controlled. And in order to do that, one needs to, to have an idea about the speed at which the cracks propagate. So there are many ways that this can be done. Um, and the common question there is how can we both take into account the details about the physics? So again, you, you can remember the question that we had when we were talking about surgery. We need the details about the particular patient that's being looked at. But at the same time, we would like to do that in a time, a computational time, which is sufficiently small. And now that energy considerations are so important, that also is energetically feasible since computing something on a supercomputer is by far not free uh, and has a very large CO2 footprint, which needs to be minimized as well. So that is the modern way of saying, uh, decrease the time and cost of the computation. Um, so we're gonna see how that can be done. There's many ways that, uh, that this can be done. So we the first approach is going to be to um, rely on uh, essentially improving the way we solve the partial differential equation. So that is known as discretization approach. So what happens there is that you split the domain into subdomains. These domains are called finite elements, at least in the, in the most widely used method. And then these finite elements can be improved or enhanced in order to capture discontinuities and similarities that are associated with the cracks. So for example, if you see bottom right, you see a crack that propagates, that splits the structure into two parts. And you see the crack can be arbitrarily complex, which needs to be normally followed by the crack by the mesh. And uh, that can be very tedious and complicated for which the extended finite element method uh, and partition of unity methods in general was invented. Uh, but that may not be sufficient because it turns out that there is a very uh, peculiar issue going on about simulations is that you can, in fact, without knowing the exact solution to the problem, if you knew it, you would not be computing it. Uh, you would just be writing it down on paper using a formula. Without knowing this exact solution, you're able to predict what the error is going to be. So how far you're going to be from the exact solution, although you don't know that solution. So this is a very nice mathematical trick, which is called goal or, let's say, uh, a posteriori error control. And it allows you a posteriori, once you know the solution, to figure out where the solution is relatively correct and where it is quite wrong. And of course, where the solution is far from the exact solution, you need to have a finer discretization and where it is very close, you may be able to do with a few. So this is a very strong idea because it allows you to move forward in a, in a much more energetically or computationally efficient way. And um, now the problems, uh, that we have associated with the major crack propagation laws is that there is almost no physics because it's based on a law which dates back to 1948, uh, which is very well known in the field, but still is a semi-empirical law uh, that was drawn by looking at hundreds of simulations and experiments, but still was clearly uh, is limited in cases where we have new materials or new loading conditions, and therefore, it would be very nice if we were able to improve the physics being taken care of in the model.
and this is one of the questions we try to address in, in my group in general, what is enough physics and what's too much? Because sometimes you have models that are super complicated, for example, for organs or for the Airbus A380 that you see at the bottom here. If you try to mimic what is going on in this um, bolted joint, you will see you have hundreds of plies. It is extremely complicated, very small and very narrow areas with debonding fractures going on everywhere carbon fibers debonding from the matrix and so on. It's extremely complicated to model this. And maybe you don't need to model it in detail. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It all depends and on the case. And the problem is, how do you figure out in a quantitative way what is enough and what's too much? First, in terms of the model chosen, which means what problem do you solve? Do you assume everything is linear? Is it, is it elastic? Does it have plasticity, viscous dependencies? Or is it time independent? Is it time dependent? Should you look at wave propagation or only at quasi-static cases? So all these questions rely on asking the question, what is the model that we want to address? And then once we have the model, we want to figure out, okay, how do I solve that problem in a meaningful way with, without too much error, but also without being an overkill? And that's the question, are we solving the problem right? So there are two questions really. Is that the right problem and are we solving it right? And in the case where we are trying to add physics to the, to the problem, usually the most natural thing to do is to look down at the lower scales. So for example, take into account all the plies that you see at the bottom here and all the carbon fibers individually, which is definitely very expensive. If it's concrete you're talking about, taking into account all the aggregates, all the sand grains, all the cement grains, the interface transition zone, and so on. So for certain materials, this is feasible for others, it is not. And the question is, when should we try that and when should we not? And when we do try that, we need to accelerate the simulation because running a simulation out of the box would actually be almost unfeasible in terms of compute time, leading to billions and billions of unknowns. So for that, there are different ways. And I'm going to try to talk about three of them. One of them is really using the compute architecture such as GPUs and CPUs in a smart way. This is what we did with Adrien Courtecuisse, who is now a CNRS researcher in, uh, in uh, France, in Strasbourg, and uh, with Pierre Kerfeden and Stéphane Cotin in Myriam. And so the idea is to use the CPU and GPU in an asynchronous way such that you can accelerate the simulation. So it's a bit what's happens, what happens in video games. And that works pretty well. And now we are extending the work that was done at the time in order to make it uh, amenable to larger structures, meaning more than thousands of degrees of freedom, more tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands uh, in order to overcome these limitations. The second approach is to use what's called reduced order modeling or machine learning or artificial intelligence. You know, all these things are quite synonymous, I would say. And the idea there is that you would like to imagine yourself in the following situation. You, you are, let's say, a surgeon that wants to operate on someone the next, uh, next month, and you have a month to, pre to produce pre-calculations, which are going to help you on the day of the simulation, of the actual, not simulation, but of the um, actual surgery, which are, is going to help you figure out the best way to operate. For example, give you um, superimposed visions through using augmented reality, through the, the, the patient uh, themselves. And for, during the surgery, this is what is called online. During the online phase, you have no time. You need to compute everything in, you know, let's say approximately 20, 50 to 500 solutions per second. So you cannot have billions of unknowns because you would need months or maybe sometimes years to compute. So now you're talking about reducing the cost from months to milliseconds by doing pre-computation. So the idea is to ask the questions, okay, I'm giving, I'm, I am given one month to work on this patient, virtual representation. What should I compute in order to make my life easier on the day when I have no time to compute because I have only the surgery time, which is necessarily limited because it's very detrimental to the patient to increase the duration of surgery. So one wants to be very fast, but we have one month to select what simulation should be done. So you see the link to uh, AI and, um, and the terminology of, um, 
of learning and supervised learning. So this is a bit the same idea here. And this is known as reduced order model or model order reduction, proper orthogonal decomposition, and so on. So that allows really to accelerate the way that you do a simulation. And I'm going to run you very quickly through, uh, through the ideas. So what you do is, you, you, let's say that you are in mechanics. This is my original field, so I'm using an example from that field. And you want to compute the deformation of that beam. You can think of that as the brain of a patient uh, with a tumor located somewhere in it, if it's more uh, pictorial for you. Uh, but basically, you have a beam, and someone will come in a month and tell you what load is going to be applied on that beam. It could be a bridge, but you don't know the loading yet because the client hasn't yet released all the information. You have only partial information that you have the shape, but you don't know the load. And you have a month to do pre-computations, which is, are going to help you, once you have the load given by the client, to be as competitive as possible compared to your competitors that will have something to, you know, uh, another design to give uh, to the same client. So you'd like to be faster than competitors, and you have one month to do pre-computations, and each computation counts, so you need to be very you know, choosy in the computations you make. So you will do, let's say, the most simple thing you can think of. You will apply a load vertically, FD1 at a certain node, and you will apply another one. And every time you will store in a big matrix the solutions S1, S2, SNS, until you get a matrix. And then when you have that matrix, you do what is called a singular value decomposition, which gives you the most energetic modes associated with that deformation. In that case, you have three modes, C1, C2, C3, and then you truncate the rest. And those three modes are supposed to replicate what is going to happen if you superimpose all the loads that you just saw, one to n. But what happens if this client is a bit sneaky and gives you a load which is beyond the elastic limit? So something you did not pre-compute. So you basically are trying to teach a machine learning algorithm to recognize a wolf, but you're giving it a cat. And the thing is totally confused. It recognizes there are some pointy ears, but it cannot make the difference between a cat and a wolf. So here it's a bit the same idea. You have an area of the beam which is breaking. You have this V shape. And this V shape is not at all contained in the smooth combination of C1, C2, and C3, which are definitely not able to replicate the discontinuity in the first derivative, if you want to talk about it mathematically. So the solution you're looking for is not in the pre-computed snapshot. It's not in the training set. So you can do whatever you like, it's not going to work out. And therefore you need to resort to tricks. And these are the tricks that we uh, try to come up with in my team. So I'm not going to go into these details because this is quite, um, quite complicated and a little bit too long, uh, but we can talk about it later or we, you can refer to the papers or I can give you references at the end of the talk if that's uh, of interest. Um, but the requirements now, if we go back to what we started from, we would like as input to use multiple modalities, assimilate data in real time, as we saw. In physics, we would like to have highly nonlinear localization, lower scales, acceleration for multi-scale problems. And as an output, we'd like to be real time, control the, adapti the error adaptively and give confidence intervals and credible regions. So this is also what is of high interest. And this is what we studied with Hussein Rappel, who was also at uh, Alan Turing and is now lecturer at Exeter and um, worked with Marc Giolani before. And basically what we try to do here is to accelerate these simulations using neural networks and deep learning. So there is nothing really surprising in us trying to do that because it's very logical moving from model order reduction to uh, artificial intelligence since the tools are very much alike. And as you can see here, the tools are so much alike that they look almost, almost the same. You still have the beam, although it looks like a potato now. You have some loads that are being applied. And uh, your idea is to try to predict the deformation as fast as possible for very large deformations taking place in surgery, but with only a few calculations in the real-time phase, in the online phase. In the offline stage, you can, let's say, train your network with as much data as you wish, including experimental data. And that's where we are heading now, which I, gets me extremely excited as my students will testify because I bug them continuously about uh, mixing experimental data with uh, real, uh, let's say, digital, real data with digital data. 
And uh, I'm going to skip the validation phase, but essentially that plot here shows you that uh, using a neural network, we are able to replicate what would happen using finite elements. So we, we basically replace the finite elements by a neural network that was trained using finite elements with, of course, most of the same limitations as we saw before for model order reduction. And in order not to take too much of your time, I will simply show you what we get as, a, as an output, which is a deterministic version versus Bayesian approach of the neural network. What you see on the right hand side is the uncertainty. So the shaded areas show you the 95 and 68% confidence respectively. So as you can see, the 95% confidence is of course a larger region and it predicts um, the chance that you have that the solution lies within these bounds. So you have 95% chance that the solution lies between the top and bottom of the light gray curves. And you have a 68% confidence, so chance that it lies between the top and down, uh, bottom of the dark gray region. And that gives you uh, very useful information, which you can use in, um, in practice. However, that doesn't work very well for standard neural networks that are based on convolutions. It works much, much, it works much better on graphs. And so this is the latest paper which we're going to uh, submit this week where we show that we can use these graphs in order to predict the deformation of very complex shapes, such as the breast, again, same application as before, using the same mesh as the mesh generated by finite elements. So this is very nice because we can get 1% local error without needing to compute things in a very, let's say, slow manner. Um, so we end up with a fast simulation. Simulations take less than three seconds. It's accurate in the sense that the uh, error is less than 2.4 millimeters and it's quite flexible and uh, it can work on, on basically any shape and we can even use transfer learning if we want to. And to conclude, these are the future directions that we want to, uh, to follow. So first of all, I would like to work on enriching in silico data by experimental data from cameras. So the idea would be that let's imagine you have this beam in front of you, it's deforming. You apply some load in real time and you image the deformation of the beam in real, in, in real life. So it could be a hydrogel beam or some sort of, of a polymer that is deforming under load. And you choose to, to select only partial information. So let's say that you obfuscate part of the field of view such that only part of the beam is visible. And you try to use that information to update the neural network that was pre-trained using finite elements in order to make it snap to the real time solution as you would do for a real patient. When you actually see the deformation using laparoscopic surgery, you see only the surface and very small part of the surface. We'd like to do some trials on uh, experiments that we will run in the lab to be able to figure out what is going on in that case when we have mixed experimental and in silico data. Second problem, which is extremely challenging, is topological changes, because as soon as you have changes in topology, like a crack or a cut that is being propagated through a, a material or medium, what's going to happen is that you need to tag things. You need to know what belongs to the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Uh, that will be, create extra surfaces that need to be followed using vision, for example, so that will be ex, you know, uh, more complicated. So we'd like to look at that. And uh, we would also like to compute directly from uh, images uh, because we get images using voxels, so we can directly use these voxels to compute using uh, the convolutional neural networks that I mentioned before. And uh, we already actually, this is already done, the one uh, penultimate point, a couple so far to Phoenix. This is called Sonix now. This is a new open source code where you can treat large deformation problems in real time and you can change the constitutive law, so the material law, by only changing one, one line of code. So this is, I think, a very major advance for anybody doing large deformations, in particular biomechanics, because it used to be very tricky to make modifications to the constitutive law, requiring linearizations upon linearizations. This is now done automatically, and on top of that, coupled to SOFA, which is a very well-known real-time simulation software developed at, in the team of... Uh, Stéphane Cotin, among others, at INRIA in France. And uh, this will allow us in, in time to work on augmented reality, where the surgeon can actually see through the uh, patient being operated and therefore actually see where the tumor is. 
as opposed to having to guess where it is or using intraoperative uh, images such as ultrasound. So that's where we're going. Thank you for your attention. I hope you could hear something. Uh, the quality for me was not always the best during the previous part of the webinar, so I hope that things are working now fine. I'm looking forward to discussions and questions and so on. Thank you. Hi, Stefan. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I think things have changed an awful lot in, in, the, in the area around fracture since perhaps we started our, our PhD work to, to now and the sort of things you can model are, are really quite incredible. So um, I don't think we've got too many, chats, um, uh, too many questions in the chat just yet, but I, I've got a few for you. So I guess you talked a little bit about sort of your specific future directions here. Uh, just wondering if you can sort of think forwards in sort of 10 or 15 years, what, what, what sort of things do you think we'll be doing then? And do you think this sort of like um, machine learning kind of combined approaches are gonna be still still common then? Uh, or what do you think we're moving, moving past them? Uh, honestly, I really don't know. Making predictions <laughs> is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, although that's what we do all day, we try. But uh, the systems we look at are much easier than uh, human systems, so it's very difficult to predict. I really don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question. But I mean, what I see is that we will have for sure more data. That's for sure. Um, we will have also Internet of Things and 5G and so on. Sensors, I would predict, will invade the world even more you know these watches where you have all your calls and so on i mean already ubiquitous i would imagine that this is not going to slow down um and then maybe maybe we will be ourselves in instrumented for medicine who knows if we want to so all these things uh, i think mean that we will have more data and the question i'm asking myself is at some point when will the computations become almost obsolete? Because when we do weather prediction, I mean, the amount of data that's being fed into the model is so huge that one has to wonder whether, you know, the majority of the, of the prediction is actually coming from the simulation or if it's coming from the, from, from the measurements. And this is also what uh, happened in a very nice paper by Stéphane Cotin, where he shows that to insert a needle in a liver, um, he has a very simple um, linear model of the liver, which is totally wrong. And uh, then he updates the solution using a, using a Kalman filter and a lot of imaging uh, techniques, a lot of images that, being, that are being acquired on the fly. And he shows that basically you can use any model and the uh, Kalman filter is going to just make it work. So you're just going to get the right solution because you have a lot of information coming through. And what I'd like, I'm interested in is trying to figure out what is the sort of sweet spot, depending on what application you're looking at. And also how can you optimize where you uh, place the sensors? And perhaps we will be moving into situations where these sensors will optimize themselves. So how they will self-locate and try to figure out where they should be to maximize the information content from their location or you know, something like an optimal design of experiments using uh, automated, um, automated sensing. That would, that would be cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is always tricky to predict where we're going to be in 10 years. It's a terrible idea to do it, but, uh, but thank you for your answer. That was like, that was really good. Um, I guess going a little bit more technically, I'm intrigued by the, the switch from the convolutional neural networks to the to the graph networks. Uh, like I think with a lot of this work, it, so the importance is in getting the input output fit to, to actually approximate your real world function or your real world um, expected mean. So is it in relation to that or was it just in general trying to make a, an improvement in accuracy? Uh, the problem we, uh that we had is that the weights that uh, are computed in the in the convolutional neural networks are fixed and um, oh, that's not the right thing. Okay, I'm not going to try to get back there. But the weights were fixed by little windows, and these windows then overlap and so on, and you get. But the weights are uh, yes, exactly well, perfect. So you have the same filter for um, for all the regions that you have. So. Uh, for example, if you have material interfaces, that creates difficulties because you would like to be able to have different 
uh, filters in order to have different, let's say, stiffnesses or mimicking stiffnesses. Uh, so that was one. And then the second was that uh, most of the time the, the mesh that we have is not made of boxes, but it's made of tetrahedral elements, which look more like a graph than they do uh, look like a, a, a bunch of bricks. So that's why it was uh, more natural to do that this way as well. And also it's easier to propagate information, I think, from uh, one end to the other end because we can do pooling operations and that uh, accelerates some of the necessary operations that we have to do in our applications because of boundary conditions. So because the force has to talk to the other part, which is restrained in order for the system to be even solvable. So uh, I think this is, this is basically why. Okay. And, and I guess you can get your, your fit based on your, the, the fact that you've got relatively good equations in, in well-known equations in this area. Yeah, exactly. I think that's super important because, um, however, since we compute everything, um, I guess uh, we, you know, we basically build in the, the solution by computing using the equations that we have, right? So, we just pre-compute using the Newton's equations, essentially. So what we get out is simply what we computed. There is nothing really new uh, at all. It simply replicates the, it's just a faster way to compute displacement from force. It's uh, the surrogate for the stiffness of the, of the component, I would say. Cool. And, and I guess, I guess the other thing I'm interested in is the fact that you've clearly worked on fracture for a very long time through your career um, and still seem to be a fan of FEA, but I didn't see any sort of notice of peridynamics in here. Is there like an interest in moving towards those sorts of tools? I mean, they come with their own problems yeah. as well. Um, yeah, or we, <laughs> yeah, it's super cool. I mean, actually we've been working with Panya Newell in, uh, in Utah on peridynamics with one of the, um, her postdocs, uh, Bojo, and that's been doing pretty well, so with one student from, from China. Um, and what we try to do is actually to try to see if we could use uh, acceleration methods similar to what we used in, um, in other fields of, let's say, in other discretization methods, fracture, to be applied to paradynamics because it's quite expensive. But what I like about it is that you have everything from, from uh, almost from ab initio. So, uh, that, that, I mean, of course, it's not exactly an initial, but we, we can initiate fractures in a, in a more natural way, so I like that very much. Uh, what I think is difficult is the computational expense. Also, the uh, explain, let's, let's say the explainability of what's going on is also sometimes a bit, uh, a bit difficult. Poisson's ratios, limitations, and a bit similar to lattice structures. Um, but uh, I think there are many overlaps with what we did, in particular in QC. Lars Beggs and my group has worked on quasi-continuum, but for uh, dissipative structures, um, not for ab initio structures at all, so for things like beam structures that are uh, yielding, so uh, going through plasticity. And I think there are really overlaps there to be, to be looked at because it's a, essentially QC is a model order reduction. And uh, so we could basically think of using QC in combination with uh, peridynamics and see, see what would happen. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, so we are actually working now on trying to accelerate peridynamics using uh, neural networks. So I think there will hopefully be something there. I, I'm not sure, but it looks, it looks it, it sounds really interesting. Uh, honestly, I think I could chat with you all day about this. It's really interesting work. Uh, across so many different areas. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, and sorry about the, the technical issues if they were on our side. I think we're getting towards five o'clock so we should probably uh, close down the webinar but yeah I would like to thank you again for your time uh, and hopefully uh, get an opportunity to have a chat with you about some of this stuff at a later date. Absolutely thank you so much for the invitation and, and for moderating this so with such talent. Thank you so much Adam. Thank <laughs> you.